I move down the hallway with my axe held before me. I uh, follow about 20 feet behind, just in case. Barbarian, as you move down the hallway, you set off a trap. Make a dexterity saving throw. Oh, crap! <laughs> I have three! Wait a second. Don't forget your danger sense. You get to roll with advantage. <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. I'm still a three! Sucks to be you. Oh yeah, that definitely fails. You take uh, 27 damage. Now, now hold on one moment. You keep on saying trap and damage, but we have no idea what's going on here. Wizard, as you speak, you set off another trap. Rocks fall and you die. Was that enough description for you? Heck yeah! I like this Dungeon Master's style! You, you, you guys! There it is again! Gary's acting, he's acting weird! I'm sorry, but I have no idea what you're talking about. And the last time I checked, acting weird is not a behavior covered by the associate handbook. Yeah, you need to chill out with all this conspiracy stuff. It's not Gary's fault that you got hit with the trap and that our wizard's now dead. Oh, I wouldn't fret about my death. These skits have no continuity. I'll be alive again soon enough due to an elementary oversight by the script writers. Phantom rocks fall and your spirit is expunged from existence. Oh, whatever. Were you, were you guys chilling out with the rocks already? I am telling you, something's not right with Gary. Welcome to the DM Lair. I'm Luke Hart, and I've been a Dungeon Master since high school. On this channel, I give practical Dungeon Master advice that you can use in your Dungeons & Dragons games. Today in the Lair, I'll be giving you 10 pro tips for running traps in your D&D games, and we'll leave it up to you to decide just how pro these tips actually are, or if they really just suck. Leave your praise or hatred down in the comments. Now, before we jump in, I wanna let you know about the Mad Cartographer. I found this dude a few months ago, and he is creating high quality, professional grade D&D and RPG battle maps for use on virtual tabletops such as Roll20 and Foundry VTT. Every month, the Mad Cartographer releases a new theme as well, such as Mythic Greece or the Curse of the Frost Maiden, and each theme contains about 10 new unique maps. And, and all maps are converted into dynamic map packs for Foundry VTT, including fully walled maps with lighting and sound effects to create the perfect atmosphere. Now, the Mad Cartographer has dozens of free maps available, but the best way to get in on the action is to join his Patreon. There you'll get full-size versions of the maps and be able to pick the tier that's right for you. Also, until the end of February, anyone who signs up to the Mad Cartographer's Patreon at the All The Things tier and then messages him on Patreon with the code DMLayerFoundry will get access to the Foundry VTT map packs for his first four themes. So, if you're looking for some awesome maps that you can use in your RPG games, go to that website below that I've been spamming you with for quite some time now. Okay, now, 10 tips for running traps in your Dungeons and Dragons game. Number one, use the click rule. This is my number one suggestion for improving traps in D&D. Now, I stole this idea from somewhere online, it's not an original thought of mine, but I don't remember exactly where I got it. The big problem with normal traps is that when you set them off, they're kind of boring. The player gets to make a saving throw and then they take damage and it's like la-di-da, who cares? That's just not very fun. It's like, you suck, here's some damage, have a nice day. It's actually more like a Dungeon Master screw job, in my opinion. There's, there's nothing for the players to really do or engage with. It's a boring situation that really just results in the DM basically saying, here, take some damage. <laughs> <laughs> that was a crazy laugh. <laughs> However, there is an easy way to fix the standard D&D trap without very much work at all, and it involves giving the players choices when the trap goes off. Choices are always good. Almost always. This is how the click rule works. When a trap goes off, you describe the triggering event that set the trap off. This is the click part of the rule. For instance, as you step forward, you feel the floor sink down slightly, and a mechanism in the ground begins to rumble. What do you do? That's the click, where the player has been alerted to the fact that they set off a trap. Now the player that set the trap off and all the other players need to quickly tell you what they do. 
but quickly. They don't get 20 minutes to think about, well, I don't know. No, it's like they give you an action right away. If a player doesn't immediately tell me what they do in response to the trap being set off, they do nothing but stand there like lumps. They've been surprised by the trap and can't react. Now, I don't describe the trap's effects yet. The players must first choose what their characters do. Then, based on the character's actions, I decide if they gain advantage or disadvantage on the saving throw, or if it's a straight roll still, or if perhaps they did something that allowed them to entirely bypass the trap. Let's say, for instance, this trap is a buzzsaw that comes out of the right-hand wall. A player who drops prone gains advantage on the saving throw. A player who flattens himself against the right-hand wall gains disadvantage because the buzzsaw originates there. The saving throw of a player who dashes forward is unaffected and is a straight roll. A player who is just on the edge of the trap and throws himself backwards out of the area of effect might avoid the trap altogether and not even have to make a saving throw at all. Then the players make their saving throws with advantage or whatnot, and I resolve the trap as normal, describing what happened and dealing out damage. Giving players this quick moment to react to a trap going off and making a meaningful decision instead of just making a saving throw makes traps way more fun and engaging for your players. Number two, limit the number of traps in an adventure. Traps aren't the most interesting of things for players to encounter in an adventure, in my opinion, so I limit the number of traps to one or maybe two in an adventure. Many of my adventures contain no traps at all. I, I don't care that they are a classical part of D&D, they often just aren't aren't that much fun. Now, you, there, there are ways to make them fun and entertaining. Yes, yes, there are. There are, okay? But the classical trap that you're going to encounter, especially the ones from modules, are not interesting. They're not engaging. They're not that much fun. They're just here, you got hit, take some damage. Okay, so then, then since there's maybe only one trap in an adventure, I can take a little time to flesh it out and make it more interesting and fun for my players. Not just spikes shoot from the floor, here take some damage. I'll be discussing several ways to spice up traps and make them more engaging for your players in just a little bit. Finally, Unless you're running an adventure full of creatures known for making traps, such as kobolds, it makes sense not to have too many. Traps are expensive and time-consuming to make in many cases, especially if you consider what are some of the classic D&D traps. So it makes sense that enemies probably only have the resources for maybe one or two traps in their dungeons. And then, when enemies do have traps, they're going to put them in locations where they get the most bang for their buck. Bottlenecks, where intruders must pass through the trap to progress further in the dungeon on chests and doors and other objects they want to guard. Number three, don't use passive perception for spotting traps. Now, many dungeon masters allow their player characters to spot traps using their passive perception. That means as they're walking along the rogue or ranger or whoever else who happen to pimp out their wisdom and perception, so they have a passive perception of 18 or higher, is automatically finding every trap in the dungeon. You see why that's kind of lame and stupid right off the bat? Instead of having players using their brains and deciding when to look for traps, they basically have someone who can just automatically find them without any effort whatsoever. Somebody's like, whoa, Luke, they made the effort of making their character. It is, it is not, it does not count as effort to increase your wisdom and perception. That's not effort. You're clicking a button, writing on paper, not effort. In my games, players must declare when they're looking for a trap. And then I call for a wisdom perception check to look for that trap. I have this same rule for secret doors, by the way, too. This makes the game a whole lot more interesting and engaging for players, I feel, when they must be alert to their surroundings and actually listen to the DM as they describe an area and pay attention. You know, instead of just plowing forward and relying on passive game mechanics to alert them to danger. It's like the passive game mechanics encourage players to just not play wisely and intelligently, to just plow ahead. It's like, it's like safety mode is on, you know, where it's like, oh, my passive perception will tell me when there's a trap or when there's a secret door, so I don't have to use my brain. I can just keep going ahead. It's like a video game. Yet you're getting the idea of what I feel about that mechanic. I I want my players to think and use their brains when they're playing the game. And if they don't want to think and use their brains, they probably should find a different dungeon master. Okay, rant aside. Now, if on the perception check, the player rolls really horribly, I do allow them to use their passive perception instead. This is my concession to the fact that if I didn't have this house rule, they would have been able to find a trap with their passive perception check anyway. The classic objection to this house rule of mine is, but Luke, 
Luke, my players will be stopping every two seconds to search for traps. I've been running fifth edition for like five years or so with multiple games a week and none of my groups have ever done this. Like, like ever. So I feel this is a phantom of an objection. Once a group of players understands that there is not a lot of traps in the game and they are either placed in spots where it's logical to have a trap or they start to learn that the dungeon master's descriptions will often allude to the presence of a trap, something you should be doing, then they stop looking for traps every five feet. Number four. When you describe an area, hint at the presence of a trap. The key here is to hint at it, not give it away completely. They open a door, you describe the entire room and all of that, and somewhere in the description it mentions there is the faint odor of sulfur in the air. If the players key in on that, they may suspect a trap, and later search the statue in the room to discover that it shoots out a gout of flame when a coffer on the fireplace is disturbed. Or the player may ignore it and spring the trap, but then they may remember you mention sulfur in the air and be like, oh, we should have known. This teaches players to pay attention to your descriptions because they are important and contain clues to the environment and what's going on. Then players who pay attention and find traps and other things that your flavor texts allude to are rewarded and feel good for having found those things. Nope. You don't always have to hint to the presence of a trap. Some traps are very well hidden by design, and there's nothing wrong with that either. Number five, allow characters to overcome traps with good ideas instead of only thieves tools. Say PCs have found a trap, it's a 15 foot wide pit with bubbling acid in it. Well, how do they get on by it? Perhaps you could use thieves tools to manipulate a control box that causes the lid of the pit to close. However, there are other options for clever players to use. I mean, why not just use a grappling hook on a beam across the ceiling and swing across on a rope? Flame jets in the corridor? PCs could stuff the holes with rocks or other inflammable material and then make a run for it. The key to this working, of course, is that when the PCs find a trap, you need to describe it in detail so they can brainstorm ways to overcome it. Okay, let's take a trap on a chest. They find a mechanism worked into the hinges with metal bars leading down into a grate on the floor. Removing the grate reveals a large bladder that's part of a mechanism that appears to be designed to squeeze it. So a PC might surmise that the trap causes the bladder to be squeezed, releasing a toxic gas or something. Thus, they decide to break the metal bars that lead from the hinges to the bladder mechanism. This disarms the trap in a way where the players actually have to use their brains instead of just having one of them declare that they're making thieves tools check to disarm it. Number six, make players decide how they disarm traps. If a player declares that they are using thieves tools to disarm a trap, require that they explain how they are using the tools to disarm it. Make them use their brains and describe what they're doing. It, it is very lame, I'm sorry, for something like this to happen. The DM, you find a trap in the room. And the player, I use thieves tools to disarm it. Makes a roll. 17, and then the dungeon master, oh, okay, you've disarmed it. Like, like there was no description of anything. It was just this vague trap. And then the players simply rolled some dice to overcome it. That is so lame, so boring. Like, like, how do people play that way? Like, if your traps are like this, shoot your players now, spare them the hassle. Okay, don't do that. Zach, we should probably not put that in the video. Take that out, we could get in trouble for that. Instead, describe a mechanism in the door jam that appears to be attached to the door handle. Then the rogue player is able to describe how they use their thieves tools to disable the mechanism. You see, it's not that fancy nor that complicated. However, this is role playing and makes things more interesting for your players instead of just boiling everything down to game mechanics. So there's actually two parts at work here. The DM must give a decent description of the trap to begin with, not just some vague you spot a trap. And then the players must describe how they use their thieves tools to disarm it. Number seven, use obvious traps. A trap that goes off requires a saving throw and then does full damage or half damage is neither interesting nor fun for your players. But when it's obvious there's a trap, now the players have a fun situation to overcome. Let's say they find a dead burned corpse in the corridor. Well, what happened to that? What, what, what should we do here? Like, why is there a dead body in the middle of the corridor? And so they start looking around for traps. They find a pressure plate and then tubes in the walls 
and they surmise it must be a flame jet trap. Well, now they can figure out a way to overcome the trap. Maybe they just leap over the pressure plate. Maybe they put boards on top of the pressure plate so they can just walk over without a problem. Now that, that example was fairly simple, but you can imagine having a much more complicated trap that requires real thought and creativity to bypass. It, I mean, it could be one of the more fun parts of the game session, basically becoming a sort of puzzle of sorts. Only it's a puzzle that doesn't suck because a lot of puzzles are just not fun, but that's, that's a different video. Sometimes these obvious traps have already been sprung. PCs will still investigate and then surmise that something set it off. This could be used to foreshadow something in the adventure, such as a band of hobgoblins that recently raided the dungeon, setting off traps and fighting its previous occupants. They just never got around to resetting the traps. Number eight, combine traps with enemy encounters. Nothing is quite so horrible as dealing with a trap while also having to fight monsters while the danger, the presence, the threat of the trap is still there. I once had this encounter where there was a room with pit traps in it. And as soon as a player's character fell into a pit trap, Grells swooped down out of hiding and began attacking them all. And then during the combat, the PCs were finding more pit traps placed about the room that they might fall into. And of course the Grell, which can fly, had no problems whatsoever with all the pit traps. And, and so we had this beautiful encounter where the players are trying not to fall into the pits and the ones that do fall into the pits trying to get their way out while they're fighting Grell. Yeah, it was beautiful. Another trap slash encounter for my game involved a corridor where blades sprang from the walls and then there were cockatrices released from a little trap door mechanism nearby. So when the trap was triggered, buzz saws sprang from the walls at various levels and several cockatrices were released from a side chamber and swarmed into the corridor where the players all were. Now the, the cockatrices were under the level of the blades and they were trained not to fly up into them so they weren't at risk at all. However, the players had to either take damage from the buzz saws while they fought the cockatrices or drop prone, making it easier for the cockatrices to hit them. Again, this was an amazingly fun trap slash encounter scenario that my players had to face off against. Number nine, use decoys that hide the true trap. Sometimes what the players think is the trap is just a decoy intended to make them relax their guard and fall for the true trap. A pressure plate that is easily found, for instance. However, on the other side of that pressure plate is a pit trap, so that if a character just jumps over the pressure plate, an easy thing to do, they land on the lid of the pit trap and fall in. And, and here is a classic trap from one of my games and many of my groups, almost all of my groups have encountered it. So, so after one of my groups fought Granny Titchwillow, a reoccurring villain that I have in many of my games as well, they went upstairs and found a chest. Now this chest had no obvious traps on it at all, but when it was opened, a swarm of wasps came out and attacked the player that had opened the chest. The wasps are not a problem and they're easily defeated. But they are an annoyance and the player who got attacked by them is, well, annoyed. Then, in the bottom of the chest, there is a single copper piece, just staring up at him as though to mock him for having opened the chest and got stung by a bunch of wasps. So the players are usually, they're, they're, he's perturbed at having been attacked by the wasps only to get one copper piece out of it all. And so he reaches in and scoops up the copper piece. Then electricity surges through him as he's nailed by a crap ton of electrical damage, which is of course the true trap. So finding a solitary copper piece in places has become a reoccurring joke in some of my groups in response to their having found this trap. Number 10, use traps that do more than just damage. I mean, why should a trap only just result in a PC taking damage? That seems rather unimaginative. For instance, let's say that goo falls from the ceiling, trapping them in place, and then biting insects crawl out of the cracks in the walls to swarm over them. A portcullis falls in place, trapping them in the room with a hydra, and the portcullis is greased, making it nearly impossible to get out, and the portcullis splits the party. The point is this. Use traps for fun and imaginative situations in your games. Don't forget to follow me over on Twitch where you can ask me your Dungeon Master questions and even watch me run my own D&D games. Let me know in the comments your top tip for running traps in D&D. Next week, I'll be telling you a story about when my players told me that Curse of Strahd wasn't hard enough. But until then, click right here to see my Traps 101 video. And until next time, let's play D&D.